Hello, welcome to my holiday living room where it's snowing for some fucking reason. The video you are actually meant to be watching right now was going to be a much larger video on fake video games. However, it got really massive and out of control and that combined with a second round of COVID meant I couldn't get it done to a standard I wanted to for the holidays. It, it turns out that COVID's been patched and a uh, new symptom is horrible diarrhea. So to make up for this disastrous failure, here is an extra large favorite things video. And the fake video game video will be coming out uh, uh, eventually. Speaking of fake video games. Okay, that was actually an announcement for my new merch run, Eyepatch Wolves Arc 2 Attack on Angel City. Introducing a brand new villain whose hoodie is perfect if you want to join a utopian corporation built around reigning in a glorious new era for humanity, or you just like comfy loungewear. But maybe you're looking for a piece that says more, hey, I'm a fucking train wreck and that's awesome. Well, for you, we have the Kimberly Angel long sleeve tee. All these items and more now available at eyepatchwolves.com. Thanks to everyone who has supported my fake anime, which I pretend is real through t-shirts. I love you. Okay, uh, video, video start. Oh, also, I'm gonna reuse that fake video game segue in the next video because I originally wrote it for that and, and it works way better there and uh, and you all have to pretend like it's your first time seeing it. Uh, okay, okay, video start. Author Haro Aso has spent the majority of his life outdoors, either walking, cycling, or camper van ing, only peering into the crushing corporate culture of Japan through his friends, from whom he drew the conclusion, wow, wouldn't zombies be better than that? Resulting in the number 8 item on this list, ZOM 100 Bucket List of the Dead. Our protagonist Akira Tendo lives the crushing life of a Japanese salaryman, before a zombie outbreak eradicates modern society but also conveniently the corporate hell Akira found himself trapped in, with Akira now using that newfound freedom to write a list of a hundred things to do before he inevitably becomes one of the shambling undead. If you're looking for a zombie story that's very light on post-apocalypse misery, but very heavy on people, electric wind god-fisting giant zombie sharks who have devoured divers and their feet are now with the legs that the shark runs around on, well, this is for you. But for as silly as this show can be, what makes it special is how earnestly it embraces that idea of living your best life in the worst possible circumstances, and refracting that theme through its different characters' response to the zombie outbreak and the individual list they write. Shizuka, for example, doesn't write a bucket list, but instead an Excel spreadsheet of ways to stay alive. While a later character embraces the nihilism of this ruined world, writing a list of atrocities he wants to commit now that society has collapsed. And while I'd probably give my anime of the year to either Pluto or Heavenly Delusion, Sometimes you just need an optimistic show about a bunch of cuties bashing zombies, and that's what ZOM 100 is. Gunbrella is Celeste with a gun, and the controls are tight enough to pull that off. Uh, honestly, it, it usually takes me like a paragraph or two to communicate the appeal of something, but I, I really feel I nailed it with that first sentence. I guess I'll keep going. This is a game where you are a soft little bean in which a single bad decision will see your pixelated innards spotted across the stage. Something that will always, through lack of dexterity, foresight, or strategy, be your fault in gameplay that will be torture for some, but digital heroin for others. Available on PC and Switch now.
Like everyone on the internet in the mid 2000s, I read Scott Pilgrim. And despite loving its visual style, it never really hit for me in the way it seemed to with so many others, which is why I was so surprised that Scott Pilgrim Takes Off was one of my favorite pieces of television of this year. Not just because of how fucking gorgeous it looks, but the fact that they've gone and done a dang old rebuild instead of an adaptation in a way that I'm sure has frustrated some people, but honestly, I fucking loved it. Shifting the perspective from Scott defeating Ramona's seven evil exes to Ramona, her failings as a person and her attempt to come to terms with those same exes, which for me at least resulted in a story that was a lot more empathetic and heartfelt, opening up so many of these characters. Lucas Lee in particular was a delight and I love him. I worry that we are quickly plummeting towards rebuild fatigue, but when it's pulled off with this level of energy and passion, it's hard to be mad about it. And for the record, if you've never read Scott Pilgrim, neither did Michelle and she had a total blast with this. As you are all aware, I am very strong and cool, but even I encounter works that occasionally pierce my extremely muscular heart. The Horizon is one of those stories. The apocalypse has happened and two tiny weak children travel together across the broken world. But soon, a man begins following them. He doesn't seem dangerous at first, but something is not right as he silently stares at them from a distance, and soon, things get worse. Whenever the children find food, he pushes them aside and devours it. If this continues, they will starve to death. Do they reason with the man? He does not talk. Do they escape while the man's asleep? He does not sleep. Do they try and kill him? It's questions like these that had me white knuckling Horizon's 20 brief but devastating chapters in a story that is a perfect, albeit heart crushing introduction if you've never read Korean manhwa slash webtoons. Using the format's pageless, boundaryless layout to communicate the bleak devastation that has befell the world, as well as the fleeting but ever present moments of hope that come in trying to survive it. Its last chapter might have made me cry, but I, I don't remember because I had I'd just done so many push ups. Hello and welcome to the YouTube Zone, the part of the video where I recommend you some of my favorite YouTubers. First off, Nitro Rad. Full disclosure here, I had the pleasure of meeting James on a recent trip and he was a lovely man. But before I hear any of you cry, nepotism, John, nepotism. First off, it's 2023. No one uses the word nepotism, you fucking loser. And second, I've been watching Nitro Rad for years. He's one of those YouTubers able to make me care about just about anything. Seriously, I now hold several very severe opinions on the soundtrack of SNES era platformer, Plock. I mean, just listen to this boss theme. It's great! But that's what Nitro Rad's videos do. Draw you into these worlds of forgotten platformers, obscure indie titles, or just the weirdest fucking survival horror you have ever seen. Blue Stinger is a game where t-shirts teach you karate and a... Uh, Alien fucks the planet or something, I don't know, but I'm still thinking about Nitro Rad's bizarre deep dive on it. And his videos on Umurangi Generations, Mischief Makers, and Signalis are all equally delightful. I'm gonna guess some of you are already aware of James, but I also want to expose his secret second channel, Granicore, which is just some of the most unhinged and creative video editing I have ever seen. No. Everybody. Links to everything I talk about in the description below. Napoleon Blown Apart is an Irish YouTuber who covers mixed martial arts. And if you're thinking, but John, I don't like mixed martial arts. And I hate Irish people, but you're gonna have to trust me here. Blown Apart's videos are some of the most insightful, compelling, and effortlessly hilarious I have encountered on this platform. Less about fighting than the bizarre culture and characters that has surrounded it. His three-part series on the fighting organization Pride is maybe my favorite video I've watched all year. A mind-bendingly hilarious, strange, and occasionally just fucking inspirational story of one of the most unique fighting organizations in existence from an era when the lunacy that you are seeing on screen reigns supreme. But in truth, click on just about any Blown Apart video and you'll hit that same level of quality. Whether it's his dive into the deeply ridiculous Ultimate Fighter reality TV show and the sheer bizarreness that came from it. Let me bang, man. I wanna do that, man. Let me bang, bro. I, I do. 
Or his video on Conor McGregor, featuring the immortal line, Calling McGregor the pride of Ireland couldn't be further from the truth. If you're an American, I want you to imagine Bruce Buffer introducing Ronald McDonald as the pride of America and you're halfway there. Napoleon's one of those creators that genuinely makes me reflect on what I do and think about how I could be doing it better, and that's why it's so unfortunate that his channel is frequently bludgeoned by YouTube's copyright and age restrictions. So even more so than usual, even if you don't give a shit about MMA, just give one of Napoleon's videos a shot. And if you enjoy, consider supporting his Patreon because without it, videos like this just can't exist. Oh. Also, he makes very nice rash guards. See, every Wednesday, I cook two steaks. I have been doing this a long time. In fact, in the last 11 years, I have cooked approximately 1,114 steaks. I have tried cooking steaks in many different ways in that time, but ultimately, I am a simple idiot who enjoys a high quality piece of strip loin beef seared to delicate rare perfection in nothing but a little salt and its own juices. That might sound simplistic, but over the course of 1114 steaks, I have become very, very good at it. The Bear is a television show about people who care about cooking infinitely more than I do. They are all consuming passion for food, not only being infectious, but spilling over into the intense scream arguments they frequently engage in. As each one of these little culinary human disasters tries in their own way to move beyond what was. The first season is good, the second is phenomenal, featuring back to back four of the finest episodes of television I have seen in a long, long time. A particular favourite being when human train wreck Richie learns to become a server in a hilarious and devastating and honestly kind of heartwarming story about absolvement through passion. Fucking sterling television, check it out now. Okay, look, I know some of you don't care about wrestling. Well, I don't care that you don't care. You should watch Netflix's documentary, Wrestlers. From the team that made Cheer, an also incredible documentary that showed me most cheerleaders I know are actually way tougher than I am, Wrestlers turns its lens to OVW, a small indie wrestling promotion quickly going bankrupt to the point that two men I can only charitably describe as business types buy it and attempt to turn this chaotic ramshackle wrestling promotion into an actual functional business. To say things go a little awry is like saying Vince McMahon looks a little like a vampire that's been inflated with a bike pump. OVW being this island of broken toys filled with both intensely likeable and intensely dislikable characters, some of whom might just make it, others of whom never will. The feeling that these people are teetering between success and oblivion making you root for them, even when things go very, very wrong. God, I hope Cashflow and Hollywood Haley J are gonna be all right. And if you watch this, I'm betting you're gonna feel that way too. Okay, thank you for your patience. I promise I won't talk about wrestling for the rest of this video. My top five favorite wrestling matches 2023. One of my favorite things about pro wrestling is the mindset it takes for people to willingly put themselves through grueling physical punishment, not for the sake of winning but just to tell a story and my god was Julia versus Tam Nakano at Stardom's All-Star Grand Queendom an extreme example of that. Just listen to the symphony of violence these two women inflict on each other over the course of this match. They haven't seen this. In a distance, 60 minutes, all championship. But now it's the champ. Oh my god! Oh my oh. god. Like, seriously, this is Tam Nakano's face before the match, this is it after. That brutality being the heart of this super engaging story about these two women with a long history fighting this final war of attrition to see who is truly the best of the best of stardom and the real physical lengths both performers are willing to endure to create that narrative, which is not only highly engaging, but something I would also apply to. Number four, Swerve Strickland versus Hangman Page. I know a wrestling match where one wrestler literally drinks the blood of another is a uh, well, not going to be to everyone's taste, but for me, justifying that violence is the story behind it. Two wrestlers who not only fucking hate each other, 
but are aiming for the same spot, one on an ascendant rise, the other clawing to keep his career from freefall, and the brutal explosion as the two collide in this grotesque horror show of a match. One that is not only deeply engaging, but more importantly, a real star-making moment for Swerve Strickland, who to me has all the potential in the world right now. The story of Wrestle Kingdom's Kenny Omega vs Will Ospreay was simple. Kenny Omega is the best in the world. Will Ospreay wants that moniker. What follows is a virtually perfect 34 minutes of wrestling from two performers, both of whom seem to have cheat codes turned on as they smash each other well past any reasonable physical limit. There are moments in this match that don't make sense to me, moments where I barely know what I just saw. All steadily building as slowly the gap between the younger Osprey and the more experienced Omega becomes apparent, till its final closing moments where a bloodied, battered Osprey cannot hold out against the onslaught of the man who is at this point the secret DLC hell boss of professional wrestling. And while the final two entries on this list don't carry this inhuman level of match quality, it's the stories behind them that make them special. Shota Umino is the future of New Japan, a young wrestler with freakish levels of charisma and athleticism. You only need to watch his bombastic entrance to know that this is the guy, and he is not who I want to talk about. Ren Narita is the rival and classmate of Shota, as well as his total opposite. He's quiet, he doesn't play to the crowd, and comes to the ring in plain black trunks to generic entrance music. He doesn't have a gimmick, his special moves don't even have names, just Narita's special 1, 2, 3, and 4. Unlike Shoda, he's completely forgettable, or at least he would be if he wasn't a genius in ring, and the New Japan G1 round robin tournament was his chance to prove that and step out of Shota's shadow. But it doesn't happen. He suffers loss after loss, and it was kind of heartbreaking watching this young lion already start to fade away, to the point that he enters his final match without a single tournament win. And worse, his opponent is Kaito Kiyomiya, the golden boy of a different wrestling promotion called Noah on loan for this tournament, and a man that Shota had failed to beat earlier in the tournament. The way wrestling works, there's no way in hell that Noah would allow one of their top stars to suffer a tournament loss to a rookie like Narita. And that's the feeling that hangs over this entire match until slowly, slowly, Narita starts to make you believe. And you think, maybe, just maybe, and... I punched the fucking air, this lowly underdog clutching one single beautiful victory. His rival Shota still ahead of him in what I pray will one day be a Wrestle Kingdom main event. Like so many of the best moments in wrestling, Mina Shirakawa vs Saya Kamatani overlapped with reality in some captivating and bizarre ways. The two having wrestled earlier in the year when Kamatani's signature Phoenix Splash went wrong, breaking Shirakawa's face. A very real injury that, in reality, cost Shirakawa months of her career just as she was building real momentum. But then this real mistake became the fictional storyline, as months later Shirakawa returned, torturing Kamatani with the guilt over what she had done to her, crawling inside Kamatani's head to the point when it finally came for the two to rematch, Kamatani, riddled with guilt, was terrified to use her own signature Phoenix Splash. In a match that was as much an emotional assault as it was a physical one, Kamatani having to constantly push through her own self-doubt while trying to survive Shirakawa's malicious, laser-focused onslaught, resulting in a story that was as brutal as it was captivating, with chest-clutching near-falls building to an emotional climax where reality and fiction blur 
they're together and Shirakawa finally forgives Kamatani. And I mean, just look at the real emotion pour out of both wrestlers. Even the commentators were in tears and it was, it was awesome. Okay, look, I, I know some of you think that wrestling is silly and fake and, and bad, but this was real. This was realer than your favorite movie, okay? Un unless unless your your favorite movie was it was a documentary in in that case it, it kind of wasn't hi my name is social media icon Leslie Bestington and I'm here today to talk to you about a clip that's been circulating online of me suffering a crime assault from the girl wrestler Raven Creed I will now play that clip This is a truly barbaric incident, or at least that's what I would be saying if it had happened at all, because what you've all just seen is an AI generated deep fake perpetrated by Coliseum Wrestling in an attempt to undermine my credibility. And I will now play you what actually took place that night. Leslie, Leslie, Leslie. <laughs> Remember, if you ever see anything bad about me, it wasn't real and I didn't do it. This is the best. Signing off. I don't know that I can give a stronger recommendation to the film Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem than the fact that they play M.O.P.'s anti-up twice, but I'm gonna try. I have loved the turtles since I was not, but a tiny weak child and through many different iterations. The cartoon, the live action movies, the scrolling beat em up and my prized Slash figure. Look guys, it's Slash, he's back. Back from Dimension X! So I really mean it when I say that this is one of the best iterations of the Turtles I have ever seen. Not only is the film fucking gorgeous, rendering New York in this searing neon glaze and filling it with beautifully distinctive and misshapen characters, it also has some incredible, chaotic, but intricately crafted action, and the writing and voice acting are both phenomenal with multiple moments of hilarity. The Bears, Io Adabri, particularly killing it as April. But at the heart of this movie is the turtles themselves. They've never felt more like young teenagers, innocent, curious, and scared, but ultimately there for each other. And I don't know, I feel like a lot of the times in media, teenage boys are depicted as these awful nightmare creatures, which in fairness, they can be, but it's cool to see a depiction where it's just a bunch of little dudes trying to figure it out. The bond between them, what makes this such an endearing story, cementing mutant mayhem as a high point in what has been for animation a year of high points. We now interrupt this video to bring you Hunter x Hunter Watch, where we cover all the exciting new developments from the world of Hunter by Hunter. No Tom, no, I, I'm not gonna calm down and, and you wanna know why? Four fucking years Tom, four fucking years We've been doing a new show about nothing! He doesn't want to draw the cartoon anymore, Tom! No, no, I'm not gonna- Oh, Brenda, shut the fuck up! Oh yeah, fine, fine, go! Go call HR, I'd love to get them down here! Oh, 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 I'm creating a toxic work culture. I'm creating a toxic work culture. Maybe the people who created the toxic work culture are the fucking morons who started a new show about a cartoon that doesn't exist! Yeah! Oh god. oh my my god, hang, hang on, hang on. No, this this is impossible. La ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I'm, I'm just getting word now that 10 new chapters of Hunter x Hunter have released. I repeat, 10 new chapters of Hunter x Hunter have released and we're, we're getting word from our analyst now. It's still the GOAT! Hunter x Hunter is still the GOAT! Thank you, Tagashi-san, for this glorious bounty! Street Fighter VI is my game of the year, an incredible return to form for my favorite video game series ever. But the fact that Baldur's Gate 3 comes so close to knocking it off that podium should tell you how highly I think of Larian Studios' latest efforts. A monumental achievement in narrative game design with freedom and choice which left me repeatedly shooketh. It's the kind of game that is a nightmare to sum up in the confines of a single paragraph. So allow me a simple anecdote. At one point, vampire rogue Asterian asked to drink my blood. Like all bisexuals, I immediately do anything any attractive 
person asked me to do, which resulted in the vampire accidentally killing my character. Something terrible's happened. Meaning that the protagonist of my game switched to a different character who luckily had a resurrection scroll, which I used to revive my original character, which was all wild, but where my mind imploded a little bit was when I spoke to Asterion and the dialogue actually acknowledged that all this happened, even giving me the option to punch Asterion. If this was one weird moment of extreme narrative reactivity, that would be awesome. But this level of reactivity was constant across my 60 hours with Baldur's Gate 3. It's the closest a game has ever made me feel to playing with a real flesh and blood dungeon master. And while the choices and paths are not infinite, the fact that they so frequently feel like they are is what's special. And only compounding that feeling is the phenomenal story, combat that encourages creativity and unconventional problem solving to the point that transmogrifying a boss character into a sheep and yeeting them into a bottomless pit is an option, to the cast of deeply lovable party members, and in particular, my beloved, Lazel, who I was with the entire game, and that's all I have to say about that. So yeah, a benchmark of modern game design and my game of the year in any other year, but in 2023, it came so, so close. We now have to transition to something sad, which is difficult to do in a video like this, but here we go. Uh, it's really special when you've been watching a kind of media your whole life and then someone comes along and makes you see it differently. But that's what Bray Wyatt Wyndham Rotunda did. This is a guy who came at wrestling from a perspective that no one else was and the moments that gave us were incredible. Begging John Cena to end him with a chair at WrestleMania 30 or the first episode of the Firefly Funhouse in which everyone thought he had lost his damn mind to him actually paying off that idea with the introduction of the Fiend against Finn Balor. To, of course, what I think is his just masterpiece, the Firefly Funhouse match itself. Turning a wrestling match into this psychedelic horror, dissecting the life and career of John Cena, and the fact that we will ever only get one of those matches is devastating. Bray passing away earlier this year. And, I don't know, considering how much he's come up in these videos, and honestly how much of like an inspiration he was to me personally, it only felt right to eulogize him in this little corner of the internet I have. Um, thank you for everything, Bray. Wrestling and the world is a much sadder place without you in it. Okay. Um, I guess while we're kind of covering some heavier stuff, I, uh, I wanted to use this opportunity to just say thank you to you, the, the person watching this video. Um, I think 2023 was a rough year for a lot of people for a lot of different reasons um and it it definitely was for me um i don't i don't really feel very good at making videos a lot of the time and it gets much harder when you have real life stuff going on or your mental health isn't doing so great and both those were the case for me this year I spent a lot of this year just, just not feeling very good, and I think it resulted in way less videos than I would have liked, and that that's really frustrating for me. But despite that, uh, I am still blown away by the support I get for this channel, whether it's through Patreon, the merch, or the streams, or just, just watching the videos, because I know, like... I know how lucky I am to have this job, and I know none of this happens without you guys watching, so just genuinely, sincerely, leaving all fucking social media influencer stick aside, I just genuinely want to say thank you. <sighs> yeah. Um, and that's, that's about it for this video. Uh, I, I hope you guys had a good, um, hope you guys had a good year. And yeah, look, I'll, I'll see you in the next one. Uh, take care of yourselves. Friends, thank you for watching. I hope you had a good day.
You knew this was coming. To begin our annual spooky list, which now takes place in December for some reason, I would like to talk about those dumb, low-poly character models from Final Fantasy VII. You see, I love these, and if you use a character replacement mod, you're an abomination, and I hate you! Crow Country is an upcoming game from developer SFB Games, and beautifully recreates that lost era of PS1 low-poly characters on pre-rendered backgrounds. Or at least, that's what it looks like when you see it in screenshots, but through some fucking wizardry, Crow Country is actually in full 3D, creating this captivating and eerie lo-fi world that makes incredible use of real-time shadows to shroud its many horrors in darkness. But it's also an aesthetic that taps into one of the most strange and counterintuitive appeals of survival horror, their occasional and intangible coziness. Think the bowling alley from Silent Hill 2 or the save rooms of Resident Evil, Crow Country's beautifully crafted environments drenching you in the nostalgic eeriness of those moments. And so while it may not be as disturbing or terrifying as later items on this list, the demo is available on Steam and if you have any love for survival horror, you gotta check this out. <laughs> In 1988, the trading manufacturer Topps released the bewilderingly unhinged Dinosaur Attacks, a 55 card series built around the very strange story of time traveling dinosaurs coming to the modern era and wrecking humanity's shit. Illustrated by legendary artist Art Spiegelman and Len Brown, the artist behind Mars Attacks, the illustrations are fucking phenomenal and rendered with an imaginative violence that makes them just a joy. Like if this image of a Triceratops curing a bride and groom on their wedding day doesn't fill you with a giddy euphoria, then buddy, me and you are not the same. Others include dinosaurs attacking the White House, dinosaurs engaging in pro wrestling, and my personal favorite, the coming of Dinosaur Satan. The rights to the card set were actually purchased by Tim Burton. Burton initially planning to create a film built around rampaging dinosaurs, an idea that clearly could never have box office return, as was proved by the little-known indie flop, Jurassic Park. Burton eventually repurposing his idea into the $100 million Mars Attacks. Yes, that is how much Mars Attacks costs. Nothing makes sense, and it never did. But it's hard not to imagine an alternate reality where dinosaur attacks got that same treatment. And while they now languish in card-collecting obscurity, it's kind of nice to look at these cards and just think about what could have been. I have spent several drafts failing to convey just how strange the Dreamcast video game Ill Bleed is, and so I think I just gotta let it speak for itself. I am the cake from hell. <laughs> Mexico. Oh, it was horrible. Tell me the story later, in bed, if you dare. <laughs> These clips convey maybe one third just how bizarre the experience of Ill Bleed is. You will start this game and immediately begin dying with no concept of why or how to stop it. You will engage in random battles where the goal is to mash B on a helicopter pad while wooden mannequins try and karate kick you off it, all as you hail down a passing chopper. From inside a mansion, you will stumble in befuddlement through its confusing, borderline, nonsensical gameplay systems, all while the game's tone ping-pongs between actually kind of disturbing and the goofiest shit you've ever seen, including 
A scene where a disembodied ghost ass takes a dump on you. Ill Bleed is not a good game, but it is one of the greatest games of all time, and I love it. If you want a deeper dive, Nitro Rad has a great video on it, but if you want to play it yourself, well, it never got a re-release. But on a completely separate note, Dreamcast emulation sure has come a long way and is easy to set up. You awaken in a forest. No concept of who you are or why you are here. You hear a mysterious voice. He is the narrator. He instructs you to travel to the nearby cabin, inside of which lies nothing but a doorway and a sharpened blade. You're told to pick up the blade and descend the staircase to the cabin's basement, where you find a princess chained to the wall and are given a simple directive. Slay the princess or the world will end. Do you talk to the princess? Try and discover who she is? Who you are? Why she needs to die if she needs to die? I mean, according to her, she doesn't, and this is all a weird misunderstanding, and she's so charming, but is she lying to you? This is Slay the Princess, a game that is perfect if you like being gaslit and emotionally manipulated. I know I do. And its core idea is fantastic, but it's the execution through its exceptional writing, phenomenal voice acting, and beautiful, only occasionally horrifying illustration that really lets this game worm its tendrils into you, constantly making you doubt yourself and your understanding of what's actually happening, leading to repeated and devastating rug pulls that will occasionally nosedive you into some incredibly disturbing horror. I really recommend going into this one blind and experiencing it for yourself, but if you need further convincing, you can watch it ruin me over on my side channel, Regular Eye Patch Wolf. At only 8 minutes, I can't justify explaining to you what I found so disturbing about the YouTube video Minus Basements in a way that you wouldn't be better off just going and watching it yourself. So let me just say this. If you enjoy disturbing, minimalist, liminal horror, you need to check this out. A man meets a group of people who are too rich, too powerful, and too empty to worry about consequence. As they spend more time together, they become more and more disconnected from reality, searching out increasingly heinous ways to entertain themselves as their lives gradually sink into a void of excess and violence. And what allows them to do this is a very fun science fiction twist that I am tactically leaving out of this description for you to discover for yourself. But it allows these people to sink to frightening levels of casual atrocity, which even as an uncomfortable horror enjoyer left me cold to the point that I would say we are now in the bad time portion of this list. So really think about if this movie is something you want to experience. But to those that do, what you'll find is an excellent disturbing piece of horror. And I don't just say that because of the screeching and brilliant Mia Goth, I would let her murder me, but because of how callously everything from this movie's camera shots to its sound design capture this feeling of a group of people letting go of all the things that make them human and becoming something else. Oh Jesus. Speak no evil. Ah, uh, okay. To echo my last paragraph, this is a bad time. Do not watch it if you are not cool with that. Couple go on holidays and meet another couple. They're fun, charming, to the point that they all together agree to travel back to that couple's remote holiday home in the rural Netherlands. And from here, what starts as agreeable, pleasant interactions gradually descends into something darker. As platonic boundaries are gently defied and social norms slowly peeled back and something very wrong begins to creep into focus. Why does the story of who these people are keep changing? Why do they spontaneously turn so distant and cold? Why does their child not speak? These are the questions that litter the path of this movie, a path that descends into an absolute hellscape of broken boundaries and social torture, creating a blood-freezing story of not just the disturbing nature of people, but what they will do if you let them.
Well, another video. Did you enjoy that? Did it help you forget about whatever it is out there that you're so worried about? Oh, I hope it did. I mean, that's why this exists. For you to feel good, right? And maybe some of you aren't familiar with me, but most are. Every year you come here, and every year we have our little talk, and I tell you what's happening, and you... You never want to believe it. I see your messages asking, Oh, I love the Die Patch Wolf character. Are you going to do him again this year? What makes you think that this is the character? And the answer is... You don't know. You... Never know. Every time you stare into one of these screens, you have no idea what's on the other side. Oh, and you'd like to. Some of you are so desperate. Did it feel good when he thanked you earlier? It was meant to. But then there's... Then there's others, and you're interesting because you... Pretend. You watch these videos and you scratch out your little think pieces so desperate to soak up a little dopamine from all your anonymous friends. And then, the next time one of these videos appears, you run to it. You inhale every second. And do you know why you do that? It's because I make you feel something! For a moment, I make you exist! But that's just a line of dialogue written for a character in a video. I'm not real. None of this is. I stop existing the moment you stop thinking about me. That's why you are so, so important to me. And I'll always be here, waiting for you, even after everything else is gone.